today's session, in today's session, I'm mainly talking about what it truly means to be a uh, container native. And um, um, so I will be talking about it from a variety of angles. And also, this approach will involve uh, adopting a microservices architecture. I know you have heard about this like many times, but I'm going to repeat it anyway. And um, containerizing your applications and also um, orchestrating your containers using a cluster, a container cluster manager and also using uh, various tools to manage those services as well as observe your deployment. Um, so by a show of hands, how many of you would say you're developing cloud native applications? So this is not container native, I'm saying cloud native. Okay. So we have a few. Um, okay, so let's assume you have a bunch of um, applications hosted on EC2, right? Um, powered by EC2 instances. Um, but that is basically, you're basically cloud-based application. That's a cloud-based application. But that doesn't necessarily mean that you're cloud native. Right? So when we ask people what it means to be cloud native, most of them would say it's about using software um, that makes it easy for them to deploy and develop applications on the cloud. Whereas some others would say it's about being able to focus on creating the applications and not worrying about the infrastructure. So that is the heart of being cloud native. It's about focusing on your application. OK, so by definition, cloud native is a way of approaching the development and deployment of applications in such a way that takes account of the characteristics and nature of the cloud, resulting in processes and workflows that fully take advantage of the platform. So what does fully taking advantage of the cloud look like? So um, before we talk about microservices, um, let's compare the differences between on-premise infrastructure and the cloud infrastructure. So if you take the cloud infrastructure, Okay, let's first talk about on-premise infrastructure. You have applications uh, that are built, um, you know, that's, these are centralized applications, right, on centralized infrastructure. And we're talking about applications that has a code base, uh, which is probably a large chunk of code base, like, and it's designed to be hosted in one place. And uh, if you take a look at the cloud infrastructure, the cloud infrastructure consists of databases and servers in various data centers. It's all distributed. So if you um, just port or if you port your application from the uh, on-premise infrastructure to the cloud infrastructure, you can't make the most of your migration because you're just moving one chunk of application to the cloud. So in order to fully take advantage of the cloud, you need to mirror the cloud, right? So you need to do that with microservices. And microservices provide you with uh, that ability to create distributed services and mirror the cloud. So don't port over your app from server hardware to the cloud. And what we're saying is with microservices, Apps are being built as a distributed collection of services, and this perfectly pairs up with the distributed nature of the cloud. Okay, so, uh, so microservices for better agility, speed, and cost. So microservices is basically um, a distinctive method of exposing your applications as uh, distinct services, and these services or these units, these functional units, will basically have uh, well-defined interfaces um, and services. Um, 
sorry, functions that will allow you to interact with them. So this microservices architecture, uh, or simply microservices, became very popular because of uh, enterprises wanting to be more agile. And hence, it's a popular approach. So the microservice approach is it allows you to, uh, the, it allows each service to have a single focus. The microservices are loosely coupled, lightweight. Um, it's a highly scalable modular architecture to achieve better resource usage. Uh, there are optimized deployment models, fewer maintenance costs, faster delivery time. So it, all of these things make microservices very attractive. And um, you can implement microservices using technologies like Spring Boot or Drop Wizard, and there are so many other um, technologies that you can use to implement microservices. Okay, so we're talking about container nativeness. Okay, so how does containers come into the picture? How do containers come into the picture? So containers enable microservices because underlying the microservices architecture is the rise of Docker and the container ecosystem. So you need to manage your application as distinct services. That means they have to run as a single unit. They have to have their own runtime. So with like using resources only needed for that particular function. So every service in a microservice app needs to be a self-contained unit. And services need their own allotment of resources for computing, memory, and networking. So this is where containers come in. OK, so now we are going to talk about what it means to be container native. We've talked about microservices. We talked about containers. So when you're developing your applications, when you're developing your software, to truly see if it is container native, it has to be software that treats the container as the first class unit of infrastructure, as opposed to uh, the physical machine or the virtual machine. And container native software is software that does not just happen to work in, on, or around containers. Uh, it, is, it should be software that is purposefully designed for containers. And that's what makes software uh, container native. OK, so let's see what the container native approach should be. Uh, or, or basically what the approach should be to, to build container-native applications. So obviously, you need to containerize, and it's commonly done with Docker containers. So Docker is the most popular technology used uh, to containerize um, applications, and you also have uh, technologies like Rocket and many others. So any size applications and dependencies can be containerized. So I know I spoke about microservices being the heart of you know, the whole container native story. But in most cases, like if you, re if you attended Asanka's talk yesterday, you will understand that most enterprises do not have, um, you know, it's not a greenfield architecture where everything is uh, from scratch, built from scratch. You always, if it's an, if it's a, established enterprise, you will always have various legacy applications or applications that are not microservices based. So these also have to be made use of. And sometimes you can't really split them into microservices, but that should be the end goal. So if you want to fully leverage the capabilities of Docker, then uh, you, would, uh, you would want to containerize these applications as well. So that is why I've said that any size applications and dependencies can be containerized. Um, so over time, you should aspire towards splitting suitable applications and writing future, future functionalities as microservices. And the real value of containers are that they are fast, immutable deployments. You can maximize resource utilization, and uh, you can get bare metal performance. And you can also get rid of the it works on my machine notion uh, when it comes to trying out the deployments on various environments. OK, so let's uh, just take a look at what uh, 
the slight differences, sorry, the differences between containers and virtual machines. Um, so a container is basically a virtualization of the operating system uh, such that you can run the applications and their dependencies in a secure manner uh, without affecting the other containers in the operating system. So if you take a look at this diagram, the major difference between a container and a virtual machine is that uh, the virtual machine has to have a guest operating system. So each virtual machine will have a guest operating system, whereas the container does not need that. So which makes a container very attractive because it uh, consumes less resources and there's faster boot up time due to this reason. So this is why containers are popular. So your code is now in a container. So what do you do next? You have to use a container orchestration platform. Why? Because just assume in your um, infrastructure you have a bunch of containers and um, let's say over time these containers increase and then you don't know what these containers do or basically there's no management of these containers. So you need to manage these containers and uh, management means you need to uh, ensure there's networking between the containers, uh, there's, you know, these containers should be scheduled, uh, they should, uh, you know, be distributed and you need to load balance if, uh, the load between these containers and the data has to persist somewhere, right? So because of this reason, you need to orchestrate containers and therefore you should use a container orchestration platform. So the most uh, popular uh, container orchestration platform in the market right now is Kubernetes. It's the market leading orchestration solution right now um, and alternatives are OpenShift, DCOS, and uh, Docker Swarm, uh, among many others. So I'm going to uh, focus on my talk uh, uh, with being uh, with like Kubernetes as the main focus, right? Okay, so let's take a look at the Kubernetes architecture. Um, so the Kubernetes cluster uh, consists of one or more master nodes and uh, will, con will contain one or more worker nodes, right? So the nodes are physical machines and you can uh, have various other resources, Kubernetes resources running on them like pods. Pods will run containers and um, you can uh, replicate these pods using uh, replication sets, etc. So the controlling aspect is done by the master node and there are various controlling aspects uh, within the master node and it also exposes an API so that we can configure our Kubernetes cluster through a user interface uh, and a, or, a command line in, or the command line interface. So at the same time, um, it has an overlay network which allows a communication between each node, uh, each, uh, all the containers. And then there's a container registry uh, that is made use of uh, to uh, basically create the containers uh, from uh, container images. So Kubernetes has uh, a lot of resources that you need to make use of in order to uh, create your Kubernetes cluster. So in a nutshell, for container orchestration, you can use pods. Uh, pods a pod is considered to be the smallest unit in Kubernetes, um, uh, whereas we earlier spoke of containers being the atomic unit, but uh, in, in Kubernetes, when you're configuring Kubernetes, a, a pod is the smallest unit, and a pod will contain uh, one or more containers, usually two, um, and these pods can be replicated um, using replica sets, and uh, deployment is, uh, you can, roll out changes using deployments, and if you want to do routing, internal routing, you can make use of the services resources. External routing, you can use ingresses and ingress controllers. For configuration management, if you want to pass in any configurations to the cluster, you can use config maps. And if you want to pass any secrets or passwords, you can use the secrets. 
you want to persist any data, you can use persistent volumes. If you want to do auto scaling, you can use horizontal uh, pod auto scalers and also use Helm um, for package management. Okay, so a little bit about Helm. Um, so a chart is a collection of files that describe a related set of Kubernetes resources. So a single chart can be used to deploy a simple pod or a complex application. Um, so we have plans to implement uh, WS2 middleware using Helm charts. It's all already underway. And um, charts can be managed in Helm repositories. So I'm just giving you just an idea about what it is uh, that you need to do in order to uh, create a Kubernetes cluster. Okay, so that now that we've understood what the Kubernetes or, or what uh, the orchestration platform is, let's talk about another architecture, which is a service mesh architecture. So service mesh is not something that came up with Kubernetes, right? Uh, but because of Kubernetes, you can implement a, a service mesh um, architecture. So there are two logical components that create a service mesh. There's the control plane and the data plane. So uh, a sidecar is the perfect example I can give right now. So in, in Kubernetes, in a pod, uh, you, can, you have the main container and also um, a container, a supporting container for that main container. So that acts as a sidecar. It basically allows communication with other containers. Basically, it supports that uh, container. And with the service mesh architecture, that sidecar functionality is um, achieved through a service proxy or a data plane, right? The same functionality can be achieved through a service proxy. So let's assume there are so many uh, service proxies. You need to control all these service proxies. So then you need to have a control plane, which means these service proxies will be controlled through a control plane which is a central place to manage a service mesh and the service proxies. So here's the service mesh architecture. Um, so let's assume uh, that service mesh, so service mesh platform is right at the bit bottom. You can see it does various things like traffic management, security, and observability. So earlier, I was, when I was learning Kubernetes, I was wondering why do you need service mesh? You have uh, services and um, ingresses in Kubernetes, then why do you need something like service mesh? So it gives more capabilities. Basically, you can do complex things, complex routing, uh, and other, you can achieve other functionality by using service mesh. So let's talk a little bit about some of the uh, popular service mesh implementations. So you have Istio, which is the most comprehensive service mesh platform. It does traffic management, security, policy enforcement, uh, monitoring with tools like Prometheus, Grafana, Heapster, and native GCP and AWS monitoring tools. And also you can do distributed tracing with uh, Zipkin and Jaeger. So Istio basically provides functionality to uh, integrate with these um, uh, various tools. And at the same time, due to the popularity of Istio, uh, Nginx also implemented another service mesh based on Istio called Engine Mesh. And Linkerd is also another popular open source um, service mesh implementation. And Conduit is also a service mesh platform which was uh, designed for Kubernetes. OK, I'm sorry I keep doing that. OK, so another architecture style is serverless architecture. Um, so we talked about how you can optimize your resources using uh, a microservices architecture and how, can, how you can implement microservices using containers. These containers need to be managed. Uh, therefore, go ahead and use a container orchestration platform. And uh, we talked about how various complicated things can be achieved through service mesh architecture. Um, so if you want to further optimize the resources um, in your microservice architecture, you can use a serverless architecture. So the microservices architecture reduces the infrastructure resource usage by allocating resources at a granular level. 
but even so, at any given time, at least one container has to run, right? So sometimes those services might not be used all the time, and you're just running them. So this is what the serverless architecture addresses. So it attempts to further optimize the resource usage by decomposing the deployable unit into functions and running those functions only when needed. So if you take a look at this diagram, you will see that uh, you get the various microservices, S1, S2, up to SN, and um, there are functions associated with each of those microservices. So if you want to uh, run those services, you basically invoke that function when needed. So serverless functions became popular uh, when AWS introduced the AWS Lambda platform. So all public cloud vendors provide a similar offering, um, such as Google Cloud Functions, Azure Functions, and IBM Cloud Functions. And um, users only get billed for the number of functions uh, they, they invoke. And Apache OpenWhisk and Fission, there are also other um, serverless implementations. Okay, what about integration services for uh, API composition? So you have a bunch of microservices. Um, they basically uh, address some business functionality. They, they do some, some logic that you want to achieve. Uh, a com you know, the, it's a, an atomic business logic that you implement. Um, if you want to integrate various uh, services, and if you want to reuse the code, um, one thing you should do is use integration services. And uh, you, these integration services will in turn invoke these other services and do the necessary integrations required. So <clears throat> if the system grows over time, you would require a considerable amount of effort and repetitive work by in introducing a considerable amount of integrations. So you can use Ballerina uh, to fill this gap in the container native ecosystem. So you can, it provides integration constructs and connectors for implementing distributed system interactions. So if you want to uh, implement integration services, uh, use Ballerina. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about CI CD. So in a container native approach, you also need to look at the CI CD approach also from a container native angle. So set up continuous integration and continuous delivery so that changes to your source code automatically result in a new container being built, tested, and deployed straight into production, right? So if you take a look at this diagram, you will, let's say you're a developer, you make uh, a code change, even the tiniest code change, and that should be pushed to GitHub, and uh, your continuous integration system should build, uh, build the code and basically build a Docker image and push it to Docker Hub or a private Docker repository and uh, deploy uh, to your cluster, uh, container cluster manager. So that's how it should be. So a little bit about immutable servers. Uh, immutable servers is like a deployment model that mandates that no application updates or security updates or configuration changes um, should happen on production systems. You have to ensure that uh, if any change happens, there is a new image that is constructed and pushed uh, into production. Um, let's also talk about different ways of rolling out updates. So you can do um, something called a canary release or a blue-green deployment. So a canary release basically means you incrementally apply changes uh, to the existing solution without having to uh, completely switch the entire deployment to the new solution version. So you can see in this picture, um, the changes are applied incrementally and not the entire user base is not routed, uh, the traffic is not routed to that deployment. It's done incrementally, right? So only a subset of users will try it before propagating it to everyone. And the blue-green deployment method involves switching to the newer version of the solution at once. So you have that being developed parallelly, and uh, obviously the same amount of resources will be required. 
So once that is ready, you will basically route the traffic to the new deployment. Uh, obviously, this would require a lot of testing and make sure that everything's working before you route it. Okay, so talking about container native uh, development of applications, uh, you have to also talk about observability and analysis. So you need to see, monitor uh, your deployment. So let's talk about monitoring. Um, you can use tools like Prometheus and Grafana. Uh, monitoring is about observing the health of the applications, including socket status, resource usage, request counts, latencies, etc., and generating alerts for the operation teams. Um, so Prometheus is the monitoring solution based on, a ti on time series data, and Grafana allows to visualize the data stored in Prometheus and other sources. So you can use this in conjunction to uh, monitor your um, cluster. Next is logging that comes under observability and analysis. So centralized logging is crucial for investigating issues in distributed production environments. So FluentD is a tool that you can use to, uh, that can be used to, uh, which is basically, FluentD provides unified logging system for connecting various sources. And uh, it can be integrated with other open source monitoring tools such as Elasticsearch and Kibana to implement a complete solution for monitoring service logs. So this is uh, logging when it comes to distributed systems. So you can use Fluent D. And for tracing, you can use um, tools like Jaeger and Zipkin. So tracing allows you to uh, analyze latency bottlenecks, root cause analysis of errors, uh, resource utilization issues, etc. Okay, so those are pretty much all the main steps that you need to take in order to become or in order to build container native applications. So, in summary, uh, modern enterprises are now adopting a microservice architecture uh, for implementing highly scalable applications that uh, achieve better agility, speed, and lower cost. So containers have enabled the increasing prominence of serverless computing and microservices architecture. So at a high level, designing container-native systems will require technologies for container orchestration, serverless functions, integration services, uh, continuous integration and continuous deployment, and observability. So that concludes uh, my session. So in a nutshell, microservices and containers, they are the future, your future, so go implement it. Thank you.